Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 189 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. It's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we have the whole crew here this week. First off, Richard, the owner of MTG Goldfish. What's up today, Richard? Nothing much, Seth. What's going on? Uh, not much. Just soaking in all these sweet guilds of Ravnica cards. And in seat number two, Chris Van Meter. How's it going today, Chris? I'm here, a little under the weather, sorry for the stuffed upness of my voice, but I am hype and the glory of Ravnica is getting me through this cold. Uh, and Ravnica is pretty glorious, so it just might work, actually. The plan for today, pretty simple. We have a ton of Guilds of Ravnica stuff, so we're going to dedicate essentially the entire podcast to talking about some Guilds of Ravnica cards, but then we will wrap up with some fish mail, of course, like always. So before we jump into the super sweet Guilds of Ravnica cards, a shout out to the sponsor of today's podcast, which is SpikesAcademy.com, the world's first Magic the Gathering e-learning Academy. They have courses from really great players like Hall of Famer Paula Vitor Dama de Rosa, so you can check them out over at SpikesAcademy.com. Even get 10% off with the discount gold goldfish, and you can learn more on their Twitter, which is Spikes underscore Academy. So thank you so much to them for their support. Anyway, Let's talk Guilds of Ravnica. So, Richard, we have a big list of cards to go through. We're going to try to hit them all without making this a two-hour podcast. So why don't you take it away and walk us through these sweet, sweet cards? All right, no messing around. It feels like the entire set was spoiled last week. Even though it wasn't, we just have a ton of cards. So we're going to cut to the chase with the chase mythic. Vraska Golgari Queen. Two black and a green. So four CMC, four starting loyalty, legendary planeswalker Vraska. Plus two, you may sacrifice another permanent. If you do, gain one life and draw a card. Minus three, destroy target non-land permanent with converted mana cost three or less. Minus nine, you get an emblem with whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game. It's a flashy ultimate, that's for sure. Assassins. So I, th <laughs> I think that Veraska... And correct me if I'm wrong, but for me, my impression was you got to build around it a little bit. We kind of have the normal Planeswalker kind of paradigm where you got plus two draw a card, negative three destroy something, negative nine win the game with some condition. But there is kind of a twist here, needing to like sacrifice a permanent, having the abrupt decay restriction on the removal, so you can't just blow up anything. So I feel like Veraska, I don't know if you can just jam this in any random card that's in its colors. If you're playing Jun mid-range or something. But it seems like if you can get things in your graveyard for value and sacrifice like Stitcher Supplier and you're trying to fill your graveyard for whatever purpose, then I think Veraska can be very good. Coming in and going up to 6 loyalty, that's kind of like Little Karn, and Little Karn, it takes a lot to actually beat through that, so you kind of have some natural protection if you just plus because the loyalty is so high for a 4-mana Planeswalker. But I still feel like you need to have some use of your graveyard or something. Not that that's a huge deal, because everything uses a graveyard in Ravnica, but w what do you all think? Like, can you just jam this in any deck, or do you gotta build around it to some extent? I think you need to build around to do something useful with the plus two. I mean, if you're really in a pinch, you can <laughs> cast Vraska and sack a land to draw a card, but, like, you need creatures, and it's it's not really a normal, say, like, Golgari card, because you usually just have a couple big dudes, what you really want are like tokens, or you know, a bunch of little creatures that can be sacrificed, maybe even like mana dorks or something that you no longer have use for, so you actually need to do something with this card, you can't just jam it in like say a control deck and expect this to be your one planeswalker to finish the game, you can't really just play one big dude and play Vraska, like you need actually a bunch of little stuff to sacrifice, uh, you know, maybe artifacts to sacrifice, maybe creature tokens to sacrifice, excess lands, I, I don't know, you need something to sacrifice to draw cards, otherwise uh, she's just a very expensive abrupt decay, and then we already have assassin's trophy, so I don't even know if we need that so, yeah, I think you actually do need to do something to, to make her work Yeah, she certainly is a build around me card, and even then I don't think it's that, gr that good unfortunately I'm just like really cold on this Vraska, uh I really wish that the minus three could kill converted mana cost four or less, 
because um, this card just does not line up very well against Karn, Scion, or Urza. Um, and you, it's just they're going to end up outpacing you very quickly with the abilities that Karn has. I think that if this does end up being in a deck, it will be in something uh, with like Open the Graves, where you're able to like gain value each time you're sacrificing one of your creatures. Uh, you know, maybe something like Stitcher Supplier or Narco Amoeba, like you just have these creatures that you can get rid of with her plus two, and then you know be able to swarm the opponent and kill them with a plus, with a minus nine. But this card just strikes me as a significantly worse. Vraska, when we still have Vraska Relic Seeker from uh, the Ixlon block. Like, that card is very, very good. Uh, in fact, recently SCG did a live versus video with Brad Nelson and Todd Anderson, and Brad had Vraska Relic Seeker in a couple of his decks. It was like a, a black green deck and a Sultai deck. And Vraska just like ran away with the game every time you play her. So I think that what we're going to end up seeing is that Vraska is going to see play, and people will try this one and end up being disappointed. So so hear me out before we jump to the next card. We've seen some cards that make me think once we get the winner set and get Orzov, maybe Aristocrat self-sacrifice will kind of be a theme. We got like a new Doom Traveler effect. Some other cards that you look at and you're like, man, if we get the right pieces to go with this, we could have an Aristocrat style back. Do you think that Veraska's a card that maybe gets better with some sort of uh, Abzan style deck after we see the full picture of this block and we can't really see it right now. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if we get Lingering Souls, Vraska will be nuts though. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, no, no. Please no. Yeah, but uh, that that is very exciting. Uh, a sacrifice theme deck like Aristocratty build would be very good with Vraska. So uh, keep an eye out for those cards. Uh, let's move on to Guild Leaders. We have Aurelia. Who actually, Exemplar. hold on. Before oh. we jump on, I actually just realized something. With Raska's plus two, if you sacrifice Oathsworn Vampire, it gives you the life game to allow you to recast it. So that's actually an engine that I didn't notice before that I just did. That oh. might actually be worth something. That's like a combo. It is. <laughs> I, I like it. All right. Back to our Burroughs friend, Aurelia, Exemplar of Justice, two red and a white. 2-5, Legendary Creature, Angel, Flying Mentor. At the beginning of combat on your turn, choose up to one target creature you control. Until end of turn, that creature gets plus 2, plus 0, gains Trample if it's red, gains Vigilance if it's white. This card's kind of scary. I think this card... I think this card's very strong. Uh, I could see it going two ways. I think this can be the top end of some sort of Boros aggro deck. I can also see it being very good in an angel deck. If you think of, like, Naya Angels, you can do something, now that we have Shocklands, of, like, Llanowar on turn one, Resplendent Angel on turn two, into Aurelia, into Lyra, and then you can use Aurelia to target your Resplendent Angel to make it enough power that Lyra gives it lifelink, and you make another angel. So it seems like there's a very strong strong like Naya Angel kind of nut draw that involves Aurelia and I think that the strategy of just playing really powerful flying cards all the way up your curve starting on turn two up to like five mana that could be a legitimate deck like there's a lot of good angels this is another one that works on curve with Lyra so I think this card is actually pretty powerful. So I agree I think this is you know in my opinion one of the best cards in the set it has so many stats so many words. It all just does so much for only four mana, which is kind of busted. Uh, also, if you look, I look at it, five toughness is going to be huge, since one of the removal spells of choice is going to be Lava Coil to deal four damage and then exile something like Rekindled Phoenix. And this card completely dodges it. Uh, Mentor is just a great mechanic in Boros. It's, it's a card that will affect the battlefield the turn you play it if you have another creature, since you will get the combat trigger. And it it, only four mana, it's just so easy to cast. Plus, you can just add this to my, you know, now growing list of cards you can find with Militia Bugler. Oh, a man, two power. Because it, it reads like a four or five, but it actually only has two power. Good lord. That's that's right on curve as well. Militia Bugler, find your Aurelia. Ugh. Yeah, uh, I think the card's really good. It, it looks, when you look at the card, it looks weak because it's a two five, but in reality, it's a four five and it has Mentor and it has flying, and it has vigilance if you want, it has trample if you want, and it has partial haste, right? It Aurelia doesn't have haste herself, but uh, the turn she comes in, she can give something plus two, plus zero, so that's like half power haste. So I think she's really good. In terms of EDH, 
a little bland. Uh, uh, previous Aurelia is like the nuts. This is like, eh. But uh, it is much more castable. And teaming up with Bruce Tarl, I think, uh, is going to be a thing here. Just like pumping creatures gets really scary, uh, especially with Bruce Tarl that gives it lifelink and double strike. And then you have Mentor on top of it. So I think she has a place in EDH. Maybe not as your commander, or maybe she's not going to replace herself as the head of Boros decks, but as part of the 99, I think it'll be an exciting card. The, the Boros cards in this set just, to me, just feel like one big puzzle. And she is like one of the key pieces to this puzzle. This card just does a ton. So before we, we jump on, I gotta ask you quick about Mentor. Uh, uh, people seem to love the mechanics of Guilds of Ravnica, but Mentor is the one that most people seem to think is not very good, especially outside of Limited. Is Mentor underrated right now? Like, is this mechanic better than we think for Constructed? Just quick answer before we move on. I think it's better than people think it is. Absolutely. It's one of those mechanics that, until you play with it, you won't realize how powerful it is. And I feel like it's, like, in a card design, there's there's a certain amount of budget that you have to put towards the abilities for it. And I think that Mentor is the type of ability that has low budget in terms of cost, but a very high ceiling in terms of application. I agree. I also think that it's underrated, and we're going to find out that Mentor actually spirals out of control pretty quickly and might be pretty decent in standard. So. It's just like stapled on already playable cards. Yeah, and if you think about it, Aurelia gives plus three, plus one every turn, right? Because you're mentoring something on top of that, and, uh, you know, you're giving it trample, so yeah. It, it's. I think it's going to be pretty good. Uh... Next, we have our Selesnia representative. We have Trastani Discordant. Three green and a white. So five CMC, one four. Legendary creature, Dryad. Other creatures you control get plus one, plus one. When Trastani enters the battlefield, create two one one white soldier creature tokens with lifelink. At the beginning of your end step, each player gains control of all creatures they own. <laughs> I don't know why they, I guess it's for Commander they tacked on that last ability, the Homeward Path ability. It's a very awkward ability for Standard that probably won't be relevant too often. Maybe there's some busted creature stealing thing that's on the way. I think for me this is just like a Regal Caracle type replacement. Like you get a very similar cost and effect getting two, two, two lifelink tokens essentially. If you have Trostani out, pumping your team is nice. It has a little bit of Angel of Invention mixed in. So I think that this card I don't know if it'll be busted, but it seems like it's a card that will be solidly playable in the right decks and standard. Uh, this is a very disappointing card. <laughs> After yeah. reading Aurelia, this is just... Maybe it's not bad, but it's boring. Like, it doesn't really do anything exciting for me, and that last clause is weird. Like, I, I don't know why <laughs> it's there. I, I'd prefer if they just couldn't steal your creature at all. Like, you, you can still get threatened or whatever with this on the battlefield, so... It just stops control magic, which isn't a very prevalent effect. So I, I don't know. It's just a weird card. I'm very disappointed with this Tristani. Yeah, I mean, there's so much potential with this card, right? Like, if we could just tweak one or two abilities or numbers, um, uh, you can find it with Bugler. That's just going to be my my, <laughs> my my call my call for cards that, you know, I'm not too high on or whatever. But, like, I'm not excited about this. I think, you know, comparing it to Caracal is very similar, uh, although you are getting significantly like less power from this, uh, but it's good for the rest of your team, so I think that you know we might see it in something that tries to go wide. Um, it works pretty well with Convoke, which is kind of cool to keep in mind, uh, but again, I'm just pretty low on this card, but it, it is the type of card that if it ends up being good, it's going to be very, very good. So, like, this card is either a stinker or a centerpiece in the deck. I don't think it's, I, and I don't think it will end up being just a mediocre role player. I mean, worst case, it lets your tokens deck kind of survive a chain whirler. Like, you have the, if you're going to play a bunch of one ones, you're going to have to take chain whirler into account. Uh, so, I don't know. I think it gets a little bump there. It's, uh, we'll see. We'll see. I think that it could end up being pretty playable. All right. Next up, we have Demir with Lazav the Multifarious. Blue and a black, so 2 CMC, 1 3. Legendary creature shapeshifter. When Lazav enters the battlefield, surveil 1. Pay X. Lazav becomes a copy of target creature in your graveyard with converted mana cost. X, accept its name 
is Lazav. It's legendary in addition to its other types, and it has this ability. This is my favorite of the guild leaders, I think. This card, I don't think it's going to be that great in standard. I don't see any obvious like combos in standard. I guess you can play it for value, but you could do some really fun, janky things in older formats where you like Lazav and you copy like a Vector Asp to give Lazav in fact, and then copy a Death Shadow or something massive or Emulating Soul Leader to pump it a bunch of times and then one shot your opponent with an infect creature. So you could do some really fun like janky build around stuff with Lazav so I love the card but I don't know if it's actually something that would see play in standard wait that doesn't work it it can only be one creature at a time right you can't like be multiple creatures at once Right, but you like you would turn it into Vector Asp, and it has a pay one black give oh, uh, Lazav gotcha, gotcha. in fact until end of turn, and then yeah, you have to like do weird stacking. Yeah, 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 you have to like stack. Yeah, that's too. I just wanted to discard a Phyrexian Dreadnought. <laughs> <laughs> make it make make your. There, there's got to be a twenty twenty. You gotta you gotta get commander damage in here somehow. <laughs> you, you can like make Lazav big and just kill someone with commander damage, but. What about standard? Uh, can we do anything useful with Lazav and standard? It is a two mana no, one three blocker. Absolutely not. This card does like it does nothing. Like you just if you're gonna have to pay X for the creature anyway, just play the creature. Like yeah. like you there isn't anything in standard that's like giant with a drawback, right? So like Lazav, total dead in standard. Uh, it will be kind of cool in Brawl, since you can have like a two mana Demir commander, but even then it's like still bad because the ability isn't going to do anything. Where I think this card is really cool is in the Necrotic Ooze combo decks that people already play around with. Like, just having this in your graveyard along with Necrotic Ooze just kind of changes things around a little bit, I think. Um, Plus, like, the weird combos that Seth was talking about. It strikes me as a pretty fun card, and I could see trying to use it that way in, like, your commander decks, but I think this card is just a huge dud uh, in standard, unless you're wanting, you know, a 2-mana 1-3, but they even printed a 1-mana 2-2 that gets bigger when you surveil, so, like, this card just... It just... It feels so weird. All right, here here's so, my selling point for this card. It looks like Batman. Do you guys see Batman when you look at the art here? I do. Uh, every time I, I see this card, does... I'm like, it's Batman, yeah. <laughs> So, what about, like, Legacy Stifle Knot? I know you mentioned that combo. Like, Stifle Knot isn't really a thing anymore in Legacy, right? Like, I haven't seen people winning with Stifle Knot decks in several years. Is Why did that go away, and is there any chance that Lazav could make that a thing people tried to do again? I don't recall the exact reason the kind of deck went away, but now that Fatal Push is a thing, there's no way that 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 deck could ever, like, be successful now. Yeah, you have Abrupt Decay as well as, as a way to, to kill that, so... And, and it was just it was just, a hard, it was just a weird combo. Like, if you wanted some combo to kill someone, you should probably get a combo that kills them on the spot. But Lazav, like, after they Fatal Push your Dreadnought, then you still have a Dreadnought because you have Lazav. You you solve the Fatal Push problem. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> that's, that's and fair. it pitches the Force of Will, the most important part of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next we have a card that was spoiled today, Chance for Glory. It's a translated card, uh, but we did get confirmation on its ability. So it's one white and a red, instant. Creatures you control gain indestructible, period. Take an extra turn after this one. At the beginning of that turn's end step, you lose the game. So there was confirmation that it's not indestructible until end of turn. It's indestructible forever, and you just happen to lose the game at the beginning of the next end step. (laughs) So I think this card's completely unplayable in competitive decks, but it's kind of like Glorious End. Like, you can get a very similar effect. And I had a lot of fun playing, like, getting to the Trials Emblem with Glorious End, and now you have eight Glorious Eds, and you can even make your Gideons indestructible so they don't get, like, Assassin trophied. So I definitely expect this will be something I will, like, plan against the odds. In Standard, I guess the idea is you, like, build up a board, play this, attack, uh, get another turn, attack, and hope that that works out. I don't think that that'll actually be a thing people do in Standard, uh, or at least have success with, but I think it's a really fun, weird build around with Gideon Emblems and, like, Sundial the Infinite and stuff, uh, Stifle effects, things like that. Yeah, I mean, there have been very few times when the Final Fortune effect has been playable in whatever current constructed format that it's been in. Um, 
I, I don't think that it will be very playable in this format, but it is, like like you said, just a cool twist on that mechanic. I'm hoping it's playable. If, if we have a Boros like aggro deck that's somewhat legitimate i think this card could do things like your opponent tries to wrath the board you're like chance for glory kill you next turn uh if you you have the initiative you just get basically two combats <laughs> if you want so if you actually dealt damage to your opponent and on turn three or four you do this i think it's really good i think the fact that your creatures are indestructible uh kind of makes it because it lets you survive combat or survive a wrath and get that extra push through so like, what, hopefully it works. What, what wrath? The wrath is currently set on the wreckage. Yeah, see, so you, you gotta you gotta wait for the meta game to shift. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what happens is you play this and you think you have it figured out and have lethal, and then your opponent's just like fog you, and you're like uh, extra turn, or like fog you, and then you lose on your end hey, step. You, it's aggro. You go all in, <laughs> and then sometimes you don't make it. <laughs> I think that like if if there is a deck that would want this card. Like the the red white split card where the five mana version is relentless assault is just actually better. Or both. Both. And then all get, of the combat steps. All, all the combats, yeah. We could take an extra turn and then we get another combat step in our extra turn. It's like the double rainbow of combat steps. If you have mentor, <laughs> you get so many plus one plus one counters. That's a lot of school. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm gonna love this card for EDH too. This card. I, I feel like Boros is now all about taking extra combats. Like, this is this is kind of the red thing, and they've been pushing it a lot. So it's exciting that you can take a turn in the middle of the turn order with Chance for Glory. And 10 bucks says it doesn't work on Moto the first time we try it. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably Because you insert true. yourself in the turn order, right? And then uh, hopefully, hopefully it still all works correctly after that. <laughs> all right, next up we have Divine Visitation. Three white white enchantment mythic. If one or more creature tokens would be created under your control, that many four four white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance are created instead. Oh man, this is this is exactly my kind of card. It looks like one of those cards that does nothing right away, uh, and it does do nothing right away. But if you untap with this, there are so many things that just become insanely busted. Like all of a sudden, your Legion's Landing is making a four four Sapperling Migration. You can kick it for four four fours. Uh, your Planeswalkers, like Tezzeret, instead of making a one one Thopter, is making a four four Angel, and it gives all of your tokens protection from Chain Whirler too, which is the big hoser to making a bunch of one one. So. I don't know. This card seems really busted to me. It seems like, yes, there is risk where you're going to be taking off a turn and doing nothing, and maybe that will keep it from working out. But we saw Anointed Procession, like, find success doing essentially the same thing, where you have to take off turn four to, like, set up for the future. And those decks were a thing before Chain Whirler came and kind of ruined it, and Rampaging Ferocidon, but tokens were a legit deck. So I feel like there's a chance this is actually very good in standard and really fun. So uh, I think that the big point of contention there is Anointed Procession was not what made that token deck. It was Hidden Stockpile. It's like not having Hidden Stockpile is a big hit to this. I think that, you know, uh, Legion's Landing, being able to turn into the land that creates tokens can help for it. And then there's cards like Goblin Instigator and like other ways to generate tokens. But can you imagine if we had a Hidden Stockpile-like card? How insane this could potentially be because then you're, you're getting the value the turn that you play the anointed procession if you're able to trigger the revolt um, so again I think that the lack of stockpile will hurt this in standard but much like cards similar to this in the past like it's going to be good in commander it's going to be cool and casual it's going to be a good spec and it's going to be worth a billion dollars in 10 years this so card is so absurd I don't know why they printed it Standard, it might be okay because it costs a lot and it's a bit clunky and you need to do stuff. But I don't know about standard. But EDH, this thing is a slam in, in so many. Like, can you imagine you just divine visitation and play Avenger of Sendikar? Or, you know, you divine visitation and then you secure the waste after, right? Or you make so a you goat can cycle token. decree of justice. Yeah, you can do so many things with this. I don't know why they made this, right? Like, why do all of your <laughs> zero ones and one ones and zero zeros like imagine i don't know like master waves or something like just like things that are supposed to balance themselves out are now broken because instead of one ones or zero ones or zero zeros 
they're now 4-4 white angel tokens are flying. So this card's going to be very exciting. It's going to give kobolds a new life. Uh, my kobold <laughs> deck is coming back. Uh, plants. I think plants are a big thing here. <laughs> you can really <laughs> like goats. Goats will also be a big thing here. Like a lot of decks will suddenly become angel decks because of divine visitation. So really good. I think it'll be one of those staples like doubling season. Yeah, I think it joins like yeah, doubling season, annoying procession, parallel lives. As far as casual slash commander token decks, I think it is like on that level as an ultra staple. All right. Next up we have mission briefing. It's an instant. Blue blue rare. Surveil two, then choose an instant or sorcery card in your graveyard. You may cast that card this turn. If that card we put in your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So not jump starter mage, but an instant. I still do not have a good sense of how good this card is. I feel like it's probably worse than Snapcaster, at least in most decks, but it's probably still good. But I am very not confident with... I could see this card being busted and being the best card in standard or having it be close to unplayed or like very fringe playable. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be much standard applications, just because, like, standard revolves around combat so much. Like, not having a body is a huge downside. But the thing that this does have going for it, especially uh, over Snapcaster Mage, is since it's not giving the card flashback, you're able to cast it for an alternate cost if the card has an alternate cost. So something like Force of Will, something like Commandeer, um, you know, something like Gush, like you're able to cast it from your graveyard for its alternate cost, which could end up being very, very interesting. Yeah, I think for standard, the blue-blue is a big deal. Uh, if you wanted to flashback or, uh, f- you know, quote-unquote flashback a blue card, that's triple blue mana you need, which is significantly harder. So I, I don't I don't know how playable this would be in standard. And it depends how many cheap spells we have that you can, you know, use this with to, to flashback. But I would take Snapcaster over this. Uh, Snapcaster is much better. You're, you're trading a 2-1, you know, flash body for Surveil 2. It's not even... I don't know, preordained, because you're not actually drawing a card, right? You're just a surveilling two. Uh, and then you, you flash something back. And in most cases, you should just add copies five to eight of the thing you're trying to flash back. Like, what you're trying to go for is the toolkit versatility here, and not having a 2-1 body loses out on that versatility a bit. I mean, I, I don't think it's a question of this or Snapcaster, right? Like, Snapcaster is always going to be better. But, like, in a world where Snapcaster doesn't exist, like Standard... I still just think that the rate for the effect isn't good enough. Right. Uh, It's kind of flexible, though. I mean, like, five mana, you get your counter spell back at instant speed. Eh, I don't don't know. Maybe. But we have so many, like, modal cards and flexible cards nowadays. Like, do we... Do we need it? Like, blue-blue is hard. If it was one blue, I'd, I'd be more hopeful of this card. But blue blue is tough. I I think that the bar for this is would I be fine just playing blue blue surveil too? And I think the answer to that is no. Yeah, that's that's true, especially since we have cards similar to that that also draw you a card. What if the taxium probe was no I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> All right. Uh next up we have a split card. We have Discovery and Dispersal. So the Discovery side is one, and then Hybrid Blue-Black, Sorcery, uh, Surveil to then draw a card. And then the other side of the card is Dispersal. Three blue and a black instant. Each opponent returns a non-land permanent. They control with the highest converted mana cost among permanents. They control to its owner's hand, then discards a card. Why does Mono Black get a preordain? I don't get it. I don't get it's it. Not, so for this card, like, <laughs> Dispersal literally could just not exist. Like, it's all about <laughs> discovery. This is a two-mana preordain with potential upside from Surveil. And you can cast it with a blue or a black mana, which is insane. Preordain is insane. And I think this card is likely just going to end up being fine just as discovery and then sometimes you can you know kill their largest creature um if they have no cards in hand which is pretty insane is that good though do you want two mana preordain would we play that i think so i mean one mana preordain is way too good yeah yeah i agree so 
What about a two-mana preordain? Plus, like, it puts cards in your graveyard, which is relevant. I search for Ascanta. Um, also, because of the new split card rules, like, this is a cantrip that you can't cascade into, so that might be relevant in, uh, for Living End. Ari Lax was talking about that on Twitter when it was when it pre initially previewed. That's a good point. So, like, I think this card is insane, even just the discovery end. So, are we talking modern here, or standard? Like, I think two mana preordain, probably good enough for standard. The bar is not too high in standard. Is this something that's, like, on the table for modern, outside of, like, fringe, I'm playing living end, and I have to make these really weird mana cost deck building restriction choices? So, I don't think so, because Night's Whisper exists. So I think that this is worse than, like, Night's Whisper or Sea Beyond. But I think it's, like, that perfect power level in Standard. All right. Uh, next up, we have Justice Strike. Red and a white instant. Target creature deals damage to itself equal to its power. I just want Frexine Obliterator to come back so you can get people. <laughs> that's, that's all I want to do with Justice Strike. <laughs> So this card is interesting because like there was a similar version in I think Dark Ascension it was, but it cost three and a red, so four mana. And it was something that was used uh, fringe as a way to answer Desecration Demon because it was just so big and there wasn't clean removal for it in those colors. Um, and so even though we have like Conclave Tribunal, I still think that this card fits into that Boros puzzle as it's going to be a removal spell that basically kills everything that you're going to want it to kill. It hits Chain Whirler, like it can hit uh, Legion War Boss, it hits Lyra, it hits uh, the Phoenix at, at the very least for a turn. Uh, like it gives you a removal spell for those large creatures that you don't have an answer to because there aren't a lot of creatures in that, were, that, are, that I see are going to see play in Standard that have a larger toughness than their power outside of, like, Aurelia. I think that's a good point. I think it's a card that is uh, a lot better than you think at first. Like, it seems like a very restricted removal spell, but when you actually look through the threats people will most likely be playing, there's not a whole lot that it doesn't kill. And it for two mana instance B, that's, that's like a Terminate. It's the Boros Terminate, essentially. Uh, yeah, I, I just built a new deck while we were talking. Uh, it's a commander deck. It has uh, Boros Reckoner. It has Chance for Glory, and it has Justice Strike. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All my you new favorite Boros cards in one deck. <laughs> and you can use Aurelia as your commander to give him two more power. <laughs> uh, so do you, do you guys think this will actually be used as premium removal and standard? Like, do we not... What are our two mana removal options in red or white at the moment? So Lava Coil is in, in Seal Away are the two big ones. So I think maybe this is more like a sideboard card or a one-of would be my guess. But what's uh, what's your take, Chris? I think it's just going to be like part of the removal package. So like if you're looking at just straight Boros, right? Like you have Shock, you have the, the new split card where it's like plus two, plus two, or a three mana Lightning Helix. You have Lightning Strike, you have Lava Coil, um... You do have Seal Away, although only hitting tapped creatures like doesn't really help from an aggressive stance. It's more of a reactive card. Uh, you have, um, I said Lava Coil, Conclave Tribunal uh, is just very good as far as giving you double spell turns on you being mana efficient. Then you have Justice Strike. So you have like this wide swath of removal, and I think that it's just like all going to be a part of the puzzle. Like I wouldn't be surprised to see like one or two of these in a main deck and then more in a sideboard or just some in the main deck or just some in the sideboard, but I think it will end up being somewhere in the 75. All right. I just want to point out this name is totally weird. Like why 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 is the creature punching itself if you're doing a justice strike? This should be like tragic slip or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up we have Thief of Sanity, one blue and a black, 2-2, two, two, Creature Spectre, Flying. When Thief of Sanity deals combat damage to a player, look at the top three cards of that player's library, exile one of them face down, then put the rest into their graveyard. For as long as that card remains exiled, you may look at it, you may cast it, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast that spell. So this card... Uh, is very similar to a little card called Night Veil vale Spectre, for those of you who uh, played back in the day. Uh, and that card was extremely powerful, um, changed the way some mana bases were built so that you could support it. Uh, and it's just a very, very, very good card. 
and will run away with the game. So this is kind of a mix between Spectre and Gaunti, where uh, the cool thing about Gaunti is that you know, the effect just persists as long as the card remains exiled. Uh, the trade-off is with Spectre, you could play their lands, but with this, you, can, you can't play your opponent's lands. But you're also getting the added benefit of getting rid of two of those three cards so that your opponent won't have access to them, um, which is a very good trade-off, in my opinion. And this is just like the type of card that you would play in a blue-black mid-range deck and just run away with the game. Like, Standard is all about all of these powerful cards, and so, like, you really can't add more powerful cards to your deck because you only have 60 cards to play with. And this just allows you to play with your opponent's powerful cards as well. Yeah, I think this card's super sweet. I always really like Night Vale Spectre, and there's definitely some upsides here. The other upside uh, that wasn't mentioned yet is it fixes your mana for those cards. With Night Vale Spectre, you had to actually pay the correct colors of mana, so you were sometimes hoping to, like, exile lands first so you could have your opponent's colors of mana and then cast their stuff. So Fe uh, Thief of Sanity gets around that as well. Little worried that it dies to shock and kind of everything, but if you can get in even one hit with this, you're not getting a horrible deal, and if you get in multiple hits, it is a three drop that can just kind of win the game on itself, so it is, uh, by itself, so it is kind of a must deal with threats. So we'll see. How much do you think uh, the lack of devotion hurts it? Like, was Night Vale Spectre, do you think that would have been a good card in standard outside of the upside of adding three mana for devotion? It was. So, like, even in the realm of devotion, there were a lot of players like Brian Brondewin, uh, and there was a period of time where, like, the Esper mid range decks weren't devotion based, but still played Night Vale Spectre just because, like, the effect and the rate was very, very good. Uh, it also was a 2-3, which was very good uh, in, in that time because you could block two power creatures. Um, but Spectre did see play outside of Devotion, um, and I think that this card will slot into that and is way easier to cast. All right, well said. I don't have anything to add because I guess the only difference is you can't cast a pack rat off the Thief of Sanity like you could with <laughs> Nightmill Spectre. Uh, different fair. time, different times. But infinitely more castable. I think Night Vale Spectre, you had to kind of warp your mana base to be able to cast it. So this will slot into any deck uh, that will play it. And Gaunti effect is always very powerful. Uh, next up, we have Detour. Oh, oh, no, no, we renamed it. Detour was our unofficial translation. It is now Circuitous Route. <laughs> Uh, we should have stuck with Detour. Stuck with Detour. <laughs> Search a library for up to two basic land cards and or gates. Put them on the battlefield tap. Shuffle your library. So this is Explosive Vegetation, um, which was a very key piece of multicolor decks in the past. Uh, and this gives you even more flexibility by being able to find gates. And I think that if there's going to be like a big go long, big mana, like potentially a Nexus of Fate deck even, uh, in the new format, that it's going to have this card in it. I'm excited to see what brewers like Ali and Trazi come up with, since these are the types of cards that fuel the decks that he enjoys playing. And we have a lot of really, really cool, like, uh, four, five, six mana Planeswalkers that's also going to play well with this type of card. Uh, so I'm excited to see what comes from it. Yeah, hitting gates is huge because uh, gates are cards you ideally don't want to play too many of, but if you're playing this card, just being able to play, like, one of various gates and use this to fix your mana, it's a nice way to, like, get around the drawback of having too many lands that enter tapped, but still have the colors of mana you need. So I think that the gate clause makes this card pretty powerful for standard, even more so than explosive vegetation would be. Plus, like, we've seen the five-color gate that's a ruptured spire reprint, which leads me to believe that there may be other utility-type gates that could see print, which just increases the power level of the card. Maze's End. Yep. Maze's End reprint. Maze's End. So <laughs> you, you do this thing, and then you, like, snapcast through it back, and then you, you're, like, <laughs> you're, like, almost there. And then I play Blood Moon, and <laughs> <laughs> and, and you quit magic. Uh, but this is basically <laughs> explosive vegetation, strict upgrade, uh, but I don't know if you guys remember, there's this big hoopla, like, maybe a year ago, where someone posted an article about why explosive vegetation is, like, the worst card in magic, and you should never play it. And the, the answer is basically, there are strict upgrades to it. There are cards that get you, say, two forests, untapped, and things like that. So they were saying Explosive Vegetation is a bad card, and everyone has overplayed it. Interesting to see what the consensus here is, because now uh, you can fix your mana very well with getting gates, uh, instead of just basic lands for EDH. 
Uh, but everyone plays Explosive Vegetation anyway, even though it's not optimal. So everyone will play this card too. Yes, I mean, so you have like you have like Ranger's Path uh, and Hunting Wilds. So like there are other versions of it, but none of those are in standard. Yeah. Next up, we have a Swift Blade Vindicator. Red and a white, 1-1, one, one. Human Soldier, Double Strike, Vigilance, Trample. So two mana, 1-1, one, one, with a lot of keywords. I added this one to the list, mostly because I noticed over the weekend, Chris tweeted that he thought it might be a sleeper from the set, and I hadn't really thought of this card as particularly playable, so I wanted to hear Chris's thoughts on this card in specific. Yeah, so I think that this card kind of falls into that uh, piece of the Boros puzzle. So here are all the thoughts that I have on this card. Uh, it, it works with Path of Metal. Um, so like it it doesn't get hit by it, uh, and it helps you flip it. Uh, it lines up very well with the Boros split card, the plus two, plus two to a creature or lightning helix as a way to uh, pump it and get through extra damage. It works very well with all of the mentor cards as it starts as a one, one, and you can put counters on it, something like Legion War Boss. Um, it also works very well with Aurelia, and Aurelia is like my pick for the best card in the set, and I'm excited to play those two cards side by side. Leads to a lot of damage and uh, you know lots of killing your opponent on turn five, potentially even on turn four, the turn that you cast her. Um, and I think that it's just like a very underrated card. It has vigilance, so like you'll be able to attack and then use it for con- convoke for conclave tribunal. Uh, it does die to goblin chain whirler, so I will concede that. Uh, but again, you do have some pump spells that can save it. If you're able to get off uh, one mentor trigger on it, then it just becomes a 2-2. And like we've seen cards like this in the past, but I don't think that like Boros as, as a guild with all of these combat abilities has been supported as well as it seems to be in Guilds of Ravnica. And it's just one of those cards that uh, seems innocuous, but will just kill your opponent very quickly if they don't interact with it. Uh, through 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 the ways that you're jumping through your through your own hoops. Hmm. All right, I I can buy that, and it does seem pretty sweet with mentors, so it works well with the set. If you can even get it up to like two toughness, it gets a lot better in the the goblin chain whirler realm. So all right, maybe the card is better than I thought at first glance. Chris forgot to mention it works well with chance for glory. <laughs> it does. There you go. <laughs> no, but mentor. I think mentor is what makes it really good, and Aurelia makes it incredibly scary if you don't have a blocker for it aurelia mentors it it's a two two gives it plus two plus zero it's a four four and it has double strike and it has trample and then uh if you're living the dream like me you chance for glory and do it all again but equipment makes it really good auras you probably don't want to play auras but mentor i think uh the the underrated mechanic we said before uh get one or two mentor triggers on this thing and it becomes very fearsome so yeah, it, yeah, because because mentor is just stapled on cards like Legion War Boss, you're going to be playing Aurelia. That you're going to be playing like there's even like a two mana two power first strike mentor creature. Like we have more uh, cards that are going to see print. Like I think that there is a lot of potential to it, and even on its own, like it's dealing two damage and it has first strike, so it makes combat awkward. Uh, and I think that the the Boro split card. Uh, integrity intervention, the plus two plus two for one mana or three damage and gain three life. There's another card that if you have a little more utility that you can add to it, its stock goes through the roof. And cards like this the Swift Blade Vindicator just add utility to that card. And again, the Boros Guild just feels like this big puzzle and once all the pieces are together, it's gonna be insane. Alright. Last card we want to talk about Knight of Autumn. One green and a white. It's a 2-1. It's a Dryad Knight. When it enters the battlefield, choose one. Put two plus one plus one counters on Knight of Autumn. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. You gain four life. I just love this card for Modern. Modern is all about trying to uh, find sideboard cards that are good in a lot of different matchups. And right now, a lot of decks are playing something for like aggro slash burn or core firewalker slash Kinjin Fink, something like that. And then they're also playing like Reclamation Sage. And here we're talking like Court of Calling, Collected Company, Todd Stevens style of decks, like those style of decks. And this is a card that manages to fill both of those slots 
slots, and might even have, like, one of main deck potential, because a 4-3, uh, it's a little bad against Lightning Bolt, but it actually is a pretty reasonable body as well. So I just love the flexibility of this card. Uh, as far as standard, I'm actually less excited for it. Like, it's obviously good. Its stats are good, it does a lot of things, but it just does so many relevant things in modern that I'm really excited for it as a way to free up some sideboard slots if you're playing a creature-based green-white deck. So I think this card is great. All the reasons you stated in Modern is very good, but I also don't want to understate how good I think this card is going to be in Standard. Like, the ability to just play it as a 4-mana four 4-3 four when you don't need any of the other abilities is very, very good. We have Llanowar Elves, so if you play this on turn 2, that is a lot of pressure that your opponent's having to react to. But the ability to just kill an artifact or enchantment that's stapled on this really reminds me of something like a Braid, uh, where it you know, your normal use for it is going to be fine, but then you just have these corner case cards, the corner case situations that put a lot of pressure on some of the very good cards in standard. Uh, something like Search for Ascanta, um, having a way to interact with it with this card in your main deck is very powerful. I think that a lot of the other flip enchantments, Hadana's Climb, Path of Metal, those types of cards have the potential to be very, very good, and just running into splash damage or just you know somebody having Knight of Autumn in their main deck because it's a good creature that also has these utility abilities really helps give you those hidden percentages in game ones, but I think that we're going to see this card slotting into a lot of the Llanowar Elf decks in Standard. Um, it just does way too much for only three mana. Yeah, it's really good. It's a Reclamation Sage, like, without, you know, that has the ability to become a 4-3, so I think it'll definitely see play in Standard uh, if these colors are actually played. But three mana 4-3 is decent. Dice a Lightning Strike, but uh, it also can just turn into Reclamation Sage and remove... Uh, any annoying uh, artifacts or enchantments for you. So I think it's actually really good. And it's also a knight. I don't know if this is going to be relevant because there's green in it, but it is still a knight. So maybe you can get some tribal synergies out of it as well. Uh, that's all our spoilers. We went through a lot of spoilers. Any parting words? Uh, we still have a couple days of spoilers left. Uh, and then by the time we podcast next week, we'll have the full set in front of us. I think the set looks great. I think I am extremely excited for it. The power level looks high. It's got interesting build arounds. I think it's really going to shake up standard. It's got cards that are good for modern. Just all around at this point, it feels like a home run to me. So I just hype level extremely high. And I was already hyped because I've al I've always loved Ravnica anyway. But after seeing a decent chunk of the set, I'm even more excited for it. Yeah, Ravnica, it looks great. Uh, I like that they kind of snuck in some cards for like more casual slash commander players um things like uh the white enchantment that makes elementals there's a blue red uh, mythic enchantment that was made uh that kind of like storms your spells which is kind of cool so there there's a lot of sweet stuff not just for standard uh w one thing that i do want to uh, point out is when new sets are printed like this it's really easy to just like kind of run to the splashy cards and also very easy to kind of like miss out on some of the, the hidden gems so things like the Swift, Swift Blade Vindicator tend to go under a lot of people's radars and uh, cards like Dream Eater is something that we should look at again because you know the more I think about it and how it's actually going to play out an application Cards like that tend to be way better than what we initially thought. So going, taking a second pass at cards is something that uh, I highly suggest people do. I'm excited where Boros is going. Boros, to me, has been one of the more boring guilds uh, when we're thinking about EDH and just, just the whole card pool throughout Magic's history. And looking at all these spoilers, I'm really excited to play Boros. I thought I'd never say that. Uh, <laughs> but like these cards, like... I think all like all the cards I'm excited about fit in Boros and you know Divine Visitation, Aurelia, um, you know the the extra combats, even like Legion War Boss is in Boros. Uh, so I'm excited where this is going, and Boros looks very exciting. I'm not actually that excited. Maybe Assassin's Trophy is the the other card I'm excited for, but Boros, 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 and 
surprising. So I, I like where Watsi is going, trying to fix Boros and kind of their space and make them an exciting guild to play. Oh man. Well, with that in mind, let's try to jump into some quick fish mail, answer some questions. So uh, Richard, I guess this is the Richard cast. Why don't you take, All right. take it away? Be the All host. right. We have like a million questions on this. Let's get this out of the way. Assassin's Trophy. Now that the week has passed, now that we see that it's like $30. <laughs> When should we buy Assassin's Trophy? What do we predict the price to be? Uh, what, what what should we do with Assassin's Trophy? Everyone is asking. My thinking is it is going to be very difficult, even if it is as good as people think, to stay over $20 uh, over like the next six months as the set is opened. So my thinking is you should probably wait until this winter, maybe heading towards the winter set release, and I expect it'll get down near 20 maybe down to like 15 as a floor. So that's my take. What do you think, Chris? So I think that the best time to buy it is going to be a few weeks into the Magic Online Redemption happening. So that should be your target if you're not looking for a set to play with. But my gut tells me that this card is going to make waves in Modern, and there's a very good chance that it ends up just being the best card in Standard. Um, so you know, it will go down a little bit when Magic Online Redemptions happen. But I do think that there's a chance that this card you know, stays around $30, at the very least you know, for the first six months to a year. All right. So now let's move on to our regularly scheduled fish mail. If you have questions, <laughs> send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. CRS Geist, do you think Guilds of Ravnica Mythic Edition bundle is a worthwhile investment for bling inclined EDH players? Should I just pay the $500 for the two per customer limit and sit on them waiting for the inevitable spike? I think that they are probably a I think they're probably a decent buy from a financial perspective, yes. But that said, we have no idea what the supply is. I'm assuming that it's going to be pretty limited. If it's a lot higher than we think, that could change. You also have to take into consideration that it is the FTV foiling, and we have seen from the past the FTV versions of those cards tend to not spike. Uh, so there is a good chance that this doesn't. Even though it is like hyper unique and people love the art, the foiling is still atrocious. Yeah, and to your point about EDH, I don't, I don't know because planeswalkers are not that good in EDH. It's from the vault foiling, so I have no doubt that this will sell out uh, as people try to hoard it and you know do something with it. But I don't know how popular it would be. I don't know how much money people are willing to pay for these cards in the future. Uh, especially if you're talking about casual players, they love planeswalkers, but planeswalkers are also bad in EDH. So, so I don't know. Uh, one epic pug is Niv Mizzet the Perun now the best spell slinger blue red commander. Ah, Who remembers geez. what Niv Mizzet does? <laughs> it draws you lots of cards. Can't be countered as you cast spells. When you draw a card, you deal one damage to any target. When you cast an instant or sorcery, you draw a card. When any player casts an instant or sorcery, yes. And it's also blue, 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 red, red, red <laughs> to cast. I mean, it's a good spell slinger commander. Is it the best? That's... Uh, I don't know. What are the other... I'm trying to look up what the other options are for... Is it Spellslinger Commanders? Does, does Spellslinger just mean a bunch of spells? Yeah, you just play a bunch of spells, you don't play creatures, and then you go off with some okay. combo. So, like, is it like the other one of choice is like the... whatever the Niv Magus guy is, where you play with the top card of your library revealed... And if it's a spell, you can cast it. Melek? Yeah, Melek yep. is one. Also, Mig uh, Mizix of the Niz Magus, one of the commander ones. Uh, makes your spells cheaper for its experience counters. Uh, that's another one that's pretty popular. Yeah, I don't know that this is universally the best one. Uh, it's probably good, and people will play it, but there are a lot. And spell slinging is, is its thing, so I predict a lot of spell singing themes for future cards. Uh, so I... I don't know that this will be the best, or will remain the best, even if it is. It certainly adds to the list of playable options. It turns your Karanos on real well, though, so... <laughs> yeah, but, like, would you even attack out of principle if you're playing an Is It Spellslinger deck? No one like, plays if Karanos. Like, if you <laughs> could like attack with card. Karanos, would you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's not what you're trying Probably to not. do. Probably uh, not. Ran in Dark Rider. If Terminus had never been printed, would Jace the Mind Sculptor still be Eternal playable? Uh, Yes. Yes, given that Jace has played in decks that don't contain white. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah, it was playable before Terminus. 
Yeah. So. Oh yeah, that's true. Terminus is a more recent card. Yeah, that's that's true as well. Yeah, like I the first my first open trophy was with the Legacy tournament, uh, a Legacy open the weekend that New Phyrexia was legal with Mental Misstep, and I had three Jace the Mind Sculptor in my deck. All right, we have Robin Collins. I'm trading for some cool basic lands for my modern deck, stuff like unhinged, unglued lands. How many of each type should I get for building most modern decks? Uh, I always feel like my rule on Magic Online is 20, and then every once in a while I regret that and play a land that needs like 22 or something, but you're pretty safe with 20 of each basic, I think is a general rule. If you want to be absolutely safe, 25. I, I always hedge at 26. <laughs> like th 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 there have been times where I've wanted to play like a monocolor deck with all basics but still want 26 lands plus like it gives you a 26 is a good number so that like if you want to build two decks that use a bunch of the same basic then you can usually source it you guys are too extreme yeah sometimes you'll play a monocolor deck but I think that's very rare I think if you're buying really expensive lands like three or four is usually sufficient five if you want to be safe but like most modern decks are multicolor and they don't play that many basics. Uh, but if you know you're trying to build an actual monocolor deck, or you know you like to play monocolor decks, then you might actually need to get like 20, 20 mountains or something. That's true, I guess. So like you could we could we could break it down, right? So like for islands, I would say six or seven. For mountains, uh, like non snow covered mountains, I think that planes is really the only one that you would want a ton for if you're playing like a modern deck. Yeah, that needs a lot of planes. Swamps. Maybe 8-rack needs a bunch of swamps. Yeah, 8-rack, and then forests. Eh, you can probably get by without a ton of forests. Mono green is like a budget deck, but there's it's not usually a real deck. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my personal collection is two swamps, one of every other basic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you lose to Blood Moon with your John deck. <laughs> I, I think alternatively, another route you could go is like... You know, if you have a certain number that you want to get of a cool basic, but you can't like afford to get that for that particular basic, then look at the options that you can afford and figure out what the cool ones of those are. So like before I upgraded all of my basics to like alpha and beta, uh, because I was never too big on unhinged or unglued, I found a cool portal or portal two art for each basic that I liked and got all of those because they were ma way more affordable in the 25 to 50 cent range a piece. Yes, Mirage is my cheat code for needing lots of basics. Uh, if you want to get like 25 of uh, each kind of Mirage basic would be my recommendation, and then get like 3 to 5 uh, Richard style of the expensive ones. And then you still have decent basics if you want to play a mono-color deck, but you can kind of like bling out your dual land mana base decks. All right, next question. JC Thacker 21 even though Modern has many playable archetypes, could the barrier to entry still be the price of decks or the price of switching decks? Are reprints the answer or is printing cards that are different but just as powerful the answer? Um, I mean, I'm, I think I'm confused by... They mean like printing new cards to shake up the meta? Is that what that is saying? Is that the answer? I think maybe like not reducing the price of existing decks because if you want to switch decks you still have to fork out a lot of money so printing new cards that make new decks but they're cheap so the problem with that technique is if you look at the cost of modern decks it really is a handful of cards like most cards are not prohibitively expensive it's fetch lands and then there's often like uh, Mox Opal or one other card that's really key to a deck. So we see like Hardened Scales is a new deck based around new, relatively new cards. Hardened Scales, Hanger Back Walker, Walking Ballista. But the deck is still over a thousand dollars because you need expensive mana base pieces and you need Mox Opal. Or if you printed a whole new archetype like Spirits is very cheap with all brand new cards, but you still need eight hundred dollars of dual lands or something. So I think you can't solve the problem by making new decks. I think you have have to reduce the cost of those certain cards to make the format more accessible. So, like, I feel like Modern doesn't have an accessibility issue because it is just, like, this wide, popular format that everybody's playing, um, and you can still be successful with a lot of versions of decks, even if you don't have, like, the most powered-out mana bases for them. Um, but I also, Modern in general is a format that doesn't incentivize you to switch decks because like 
you're only going to do well in modern if you learn your deck and do well with your deck. So like if you're having issues with picking a deck, then I would suggest that you figure out a deck. But I actually am an advocate for not switching decks in modern. Like find what you like to play and get good at it because any deck is just one standard deviation of their opening hand away from winning any given modern tournament. So it doesn't matter if you like 8-rack or Titan Shift or Hardened Scales, just like get the deck and get good at it and don't worry about switching decks because it's just going to reduce your chances of doing well. All right, well said. Uh, robot not. Can you explain how pre-sale pricing works? There seems to be a dramatic drop in prices when a set is released. So what's the point of buying so soon? Just trying to figure out when to buy a playset of Assassin's Trophy. There really isn't. Unless you need the cards and you can pick them up on release weekend or something, there is very rarely a good reason to buy your cards during pre-sale periods. Like, occasionally there's underpriced cards if you want to do the finance thing and try to guess at the ones that are underpriced, but if you're just trying to build a collection, just the general rule to save money is just don't pre-order, period. Yeah, so, like, there's this weird game that happens with pre-order where the benefit to getting your cards early is getting them at a price before they go up. So when you're able to identify that, then it's worth getting them. Something like a, something like Assassin's Trophy, for those of you who got it at $14.99 when it started, $19.99 when it bumped, I got mine at $27.99 uh, just because I knew that they would probably go a little bit higher. Plus, I'm playing in, in a tournament that weekend, so I need to get the cards or have access to them. Um, but if you don't need the cards for that weekend or you aren't sure what's going to happen with the price, then it's worth holding off. A good example is Aurelia. She started at $14.99-ish on most sites, and now she's down in the $9.99-ish range. So, like, you know, if, if, if you're able to... You know, cancel your your order and then reorder the Aurelias. If she goes down, some websites will have like a low price guarantee to help with the risks for it. But like, if you're not trying to play the stock market game to get things cheap before they go up, or needing the cards for that weekend, you know, you're really better off just waiting until everything comes out to see where the prices settle. Yeah, most people are just paying the tax of being the first person to play the deck. Like, if you want to play the deck on release weekend you have no choice but to pay the high prices, right? So like most of the time, like 99% of the time, the price will go down. And, you know, we all remember Narset or whatever is like $60 and is now like a $10 card, right? You you run that risk, but if you wanted to play a Narset deck on the first week, you, you just have no choice and you have to pay that price. And it's basically because there's no supply. People haven't opened enough boxes yet. They haven't done their events. Uh, there's just not enough of these cards on the market. One of the things that I like to do during the release, like the, the pre-sale time, is so I stay away from like high ticket mythics and planeswalkers because those are usually a bit overpriced. But I'll look for the mythics that I think are a little underpriced or the rares that I think are a little underpriced and pick up some of them so that like when the set hits and the prices go up, I can trade them uh, to other people or into stores to try and pick up those high ticket mythics when their price starts to go to go down. So uh, a good example when I've done this in the past is uh, Walking Ballista. You know, was pre-selling for only a couple dollars, and I knew that card was going to end up being good, so I bought a few. Uh, Champion of Wits was another card. I was able to get in about 30 copies of them through TCG Player uh, for you know 29 cents during the pre-sale time, just because like I you know we were playing it on. Uh, you know, and testing for the events, and you know, Brennan and Tannen were like, "Hey, this card's busted. Like, if you're gonna spec on something, you, you know, you should check this out." So, like, that's when you know, when you're able to identify cards that are good or that are underpriced, you know, it might not be a bad idea to spend five or ten bucks to pick some up and then trade them off when they go up in price to get the high ticket items. Uh, but again, it's still all risk versus reward and. You know, if that's not something that you enjoy looking at the market and trying to spec on cards, then you don't you don't need to do it. Just wait until the, the other set side comes of that is I once bought forty five copies of Crucible of the Spirit Dragon <laughs> for like twenty nine cents, and it was the worst uh, the worst investment I ever made. Oh man, yeah, I I have some pretty horrific spec stories. In fact, I I have a box of failures that I keep here. Um, when I was helping BBD test for uh, the Whatever set had Jeskai yeah, Sentence, it was that Kanzatarkir. So 
Pro Tour Cons of Tarkir, like we found the Jeskai Ascendancy combo deck that Li Shi Tian ended up top eighting with, but it was a different version with Twin Flame. And so I so I have about three hundred twin flame twin flames that I bought for like ten or fifteen cents a piece, just in a in a box doing nothing. That is That's a lot of twin flames. That wraps up our fish mail. So if you have any questions, send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. And I think that brings us to the end of episode 189 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So, Chris, Richard, thanks for hanging out. It's always fun. Everyone, thank you for listening. Spikes Academy, thank you to them for their support. Check them out, spikesacademy.com, 10% off with the coupon code GOLDFISH. So we'll be back next week. Tons to talk about. The rest of Guilds of Ravnica will be out. We have World Championships this weekend, so tons of topic. So until then, have a wonderful week, and this is the crew signing out.